right, so tell me your your origin story. My origin story? <laughs> yeah, your origin story. Oh. Of like what got you to start doing this kind of stuff to begin with. <laughs> um, well, I was born, of, born from humans. Uh-huh. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, yeah, I mean, I guess, I don't know, I mean, I don't know how much it ties to my childhood, but I definitely grew up kind of more, for the my earliest part of my childhood in, in, in nature, like on you know, 40, 60 acres, um, you know, we had horses, um, didn't really have any other animals besides dogs, and feral cats and, and horses. My dad was really into other animals, but we had you know, a garden and uh, a big fruit orchard of, you know, not a monoculture, just like every fruit tree you can kind of imagine in our yard. What was your favorite one, the jumper? Um, yeah. Um, What'd you do then? I, uh, yeah, I just did these. Okay. Um, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know. I mean, as a kid, I mean, maybe like more of the cherries, maybe. I don't, it's funny, I don't like, I didn't like blueberries when I was a kid. What? I don't know why. Um, but anyways, I think that, you know, just kind of being out and in that landscape, mm -hmm. more in central Oregon, in the Columbia River Gorge there just made me want to have more space around me, you know, and, mm -hmm. but, you know, in terms of the pigment stuff and painting, I mean, that, none of that really, I mean, I painted, did a little bit of art in high school, but didn't really think about that as a career, you know, mm -hmm. um, and so not until I went to college, and I was thinking about being a vet, but then ended up, stopped doing that and just kind of started taking art classes at, at Oregon State University. So, but I was fortunate to have a professor, um, Sandy Brooke, that taught me how to make paint because I was just using a lot of it. Mm -hmm. And it was not with pigments that I was gathering, it was just pigments, you know, of vine that were mostly modern. And some of them probably natural, but a lot of them man-made pigments. And can get expensive as a student. Huh? Yeah, yeah, and the quality's better. Mm -hmm. um, if you just buy them or buy the pigment and make your own paint rather than they use a lot of fillers and stuff and paint on chalk and so that's kind of what got me into making the paint you know and then at some point when i graduated and i went for worked for a company that made paints um and then once i you know and they kind of had some disagreements with how they did things because they used a lot of fillers in their paints and different stuff and they don't know that it's not just them all of them they don't there's no requirement to like label like what's in the paint and besides the pigment itself because mm -hmm. of safety OSHA, you know standard kind of stuff um, are we talking like paints for everything like um, buildings and things too just for I me mean, for art purposes oh, okay yeah. but so at some point i kind of shifted gears um, with even with my own paint making and understanding where stuff comes from you know and of course even man-made pigments have to yes. come from some raw material source right like you know it just doesn't you just don't make raw pig, you know man-made pigments out of thin air right you have to have elements that come from that have been refined out of nature in order to then Recombine them in a lab, right? Mm -hmm. to, to make a new pigment. And so, I just did these. Okay. And I'm about to do these last two right Okay. Um, We're seating, by the way, just to let y'all know. Uh, this is Susana Chicana Nature. I'm sitting with uh, Scott Sutton. And I know, like, it's a little off center, but that's okay. Like, y'all are just gonna have to deal with that. I'll start here on this one. Okay. okay. Can you tell us what we're seeding? Like, um, we are seeding matter, um, which is used for a red pigment similar to like the cochineal color, but the plant version rather than the bug version. Um, 
and it's the roots of this plant that are used, but it takes three years from when you plant the seed to for the plant to get enough growth in both the roots and just the whole plant itself, but the, the root itself to be large enough to harvest it for for making dye pigment with. Um, so yeah, that's what we're seeding now. There's a bunch of other stuff that needs to be seeded of other dye plants, but this is maybe the first and foremost. I got the indigo already seeded. I didn't. I, I was cold stratifying in the freezer that the wild indigo. Um, so that's happening, which actually those have probably been in the freezer long enough. We'll probably take them out and seed them as well. Into when you say cold, what did you say again? Cold stratify. So a lot of seeds need certain things to happen and mm -hmm. plants that naturally grow in cold environments. So it would, in nature. I haven't hit these yet. Okay. Um, I, I, I already got these ones, so I'm going to go this way. Okay. Um, so plants that are, you know, depending on where they're originally from, need certain requirements, but like some plants that are native to colder climates need that cold, need, need to like go to flower, the seeds to drop, and for the temperatures to get, for them to be, you know, freezing or close to freezing for X amount of time over the winter before they are able to germinate, which helps to break down the, whatever. The so like, the grapes do that, don't they? Um, I don't know, actually. Um, I haven't really done much with grapes. Other I'm plants guessing. need to be scarified, where like you'd scratch it, right? The surface of the thing, or they might need to be like digested through a stomach of a bird, where it gets acid, or like they're exposed berries, to right? fire. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, and then like most seeds, like they're more like vegetable seeds, like tomatoes and that are more like warm climate ones don't need to be cold stratified because they're from warmer climates. Mm -hmm. So that's just how they adapted, I guess, but uh, so we got one in there but not there. These are all done. Okay. Maybe there's a seed in there. Um, I think there's a seed. Um, so yeah, so that's kind of the stratifying um, this is why you should pay attention um, I'm putting them and then covering them because I know I would forget and that's smart it's one of those like you know how when you have systems for things you you understand systems um, it's like it's like having systems for yourself so that you you know, can set yourself up for success later. So there's less likely of any, like, any mistakes. Mm -hmm. Although I hate to use that term, mistake. It's really just about our choices. Maybe. So you were in Oregon, and then at some point you were here, and then you're back again. Yeah, I, I moved to Taos originally in 2000 to 2003 mm -hmm. and came here, lived not too far from where we're at now. Um, first, I, it was just in town and then I was making paints with the pigments that I was buying. <clears throat> and then kind of, you know, but back then there was no internet, whatever, no way to like sell them besides door to door mm -hmm. situation. So it was kind of limited in terms of whatever, and then, but at that time, it was that was the first time that I visited Abiquiu and kind of had collected some minerals, but didn't really process them until I had returned back to Oregon after 2003. How old were you then? Uh, you know, 2024. Um, so that makes you how old now? Uh, 44. Oh, okay. Like 20 years between <laughs> when I lived here before. and But then I was an out, you know, and I went back to Oregon and then came back to New Mexico to do grad school from 2009 to 2012 in the landscape architecture program down at UNM. And so that essentially kind of provided me with more 
other skill sets and with like if you don't you know think about mapping and all these other systems that are helpful for a variety of things from growing plants to finding minerals and designing spaces um, so so yeah and then I went back to Oregon after I got a grad school and then um, yeah I did that last okay. session um, so it looks like we could maybe use <laughs> a flat or two um, it's hard to say whether or not I should just do two and one or just two and one I guess the, if we do one more Do another flat and then okay. um, maybe put like, I don't know, maybe I should just do them all one per thing and just get more flats. Um, I'm gonna have some. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm gonna ask you because you got to watch us do um, the pits and peaks mm -hmm. of like, you know, our trip the last time. So what would you say have been your pits in this like journey of creating pigments and like what have been some of your peaks? Um, oh no. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm making you process. You didn't know that I was going to be like using my old professional counseling stuff. Right. <laughs> well, I mean, I think that. You can think about it. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I, don't, I mean, I, in terms of collecting and processing stuff, I mean, there's always a learning curve, you know. Mm -hmm. But I don't know, if, I don't know if I call that either a pit or a peak because it's just part of the process. Mm -hmm. um, I think, just mostly, I think the pits and peaks is more like just on a personal level trying to figure out like what to do, what's the best, what's the best way to use your time. Mm -hmm. and skills in the most valuable way that also makes you happy mm -hmm. so I think those are probably like the hardest things you know is like how to make a living doing what you love you know mm -hmm. and, yeah um, I do know <laughs> <laughs> without it becoming this uh, you know something that's I guess stressful or, yeah, yeah. Um, do you find yourself having like better balance now Having done this a long time, or are you still working on like the balance of work and life? Um, I'm still working it out. Um, actually, just had a Zoom meeting with a small business advisor through Taos County to try to figure out like how to best. That's um, right. We were talking about that. How to best. Um, create an, I guess an official business and how to, mm -hmm. how to strategize around that and, um, and so you know forming an LLC and, and why and you know it's like pigment hunter like and, you know one of the things was to maybe just essentially create an LLC that's like a parent company that then you can do other mm -hmm. deep doing business as like pigment hunter would be just kind of more of a brand mm -hmm. rather than make an ad an LLC because I have my, my artwork that I want to be doing and selling and I'm kind of wanting to shift away from making paints to sell you know and so it's kind of you know and having the pigment hunter just be more of an educational thing in the residence program and you know so those are kind of the things that I'm trying to figure out but I, you know I already kind of have certain brand names or certain uh, websites that I've already kind of purchased, you know, and it's just trying to be an official professional business, mm. I guess. It's like a challenge, you know? I'm just not a, I don't have an MBA, <laughs> put it that way. <laughs> Neither do I. <laughs> I'm uh, basically like one of those people that just kind of like learns by experience. I mean, think about it, like criminal justice, social work, professional counseling, and then I'm out teaching people about science and nature. Sure. <laughs> you know? Yeah, you never know where it's all yeah. going to lead, yeah. but for me, yeah, I think the biggest, some of the lessons learned, I mean, one, there's, there's always a lesson in every 
situation, every place you lived, you were in every relationship, I guess. And um, but when I lived here back in 2000, I didn't really know anything about building or landscapes or you know, I was just an artist making paint and painting, you know. And, um, and now I have other skill sets that I've developed over the years, probably from grad school and probably from real life experience beyond grad school. Um, and applying that knowledge to place, you know, and, and so now I'm more prepared, you know, like I have more things to kind of like, oh, I didn't push these ones down. Um, so that's better, you know, like in terms of what I, what I can bring to the table for myself, you know. Um, it's just, I mean, even beyond the pigments and making paint, I have a tendency to want to do and create everything. You know, like I don't, I'm not going to hire someone to build me a house. I'm going to build it. <laughs> hire someone to like make paints for me I'm going to make the paints you know? that's why you have so, the shipping container right? sell your home right yeah. and the guys you tell you what yeah. Yeah. so yeah I don't know so those are the I think for pits and peaks you know it's like those learning curves and then just also learn, learning where to focus your energy and the right time and place for everything I guess we could. I was gonna. Do some more. Yeah, and I was gonna cut open. Um, All right, y'all. So we're gonna get off of here, and then we're gonna do some more seating probably because I I did say an hour, but we've been talking too. So <laughs> anyway, um, this was Scott Sutton. If you haven't already like started following him, follow him. Uh, his handle is Pigman Hunter, and then you have another one, don't you? Uh yeah, Arterialist Design. I'm following them too on both of them. Check out Chicana Nature, like follower. Y'all know how to do the thing. Mm -hmm. Do all the stalking. But um, probably going to wind up asking him more questions at some point because there were some people that had not sent me questions for him. That's all. Anyway, y'all take care. Bye. Mm -hmm.